So hey, hi, hello. I uh, want to do something a little weird today. I, I don't want this phone over here. <laughs> I want to read. I want to read. I, uh, I've been wanting a little bit to, to reread Che Guevara's Guerrilla Warfare. And it wasn't until a conversation I was having with a friend uh, 15, 20 minutes ago that I decided, well, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll reread it. The the impetus, or the reasoning behind it, are, are many, but mostly, I just haven't read this thing in ten years, close to a decade, anyway. In my political standing has changed a bit. Then my understanding of economics and the world has shifted, and well, in times like these, it seems like an appropriate appropriate opportunity to maybe maybe reflect on successful guerrilla campaigns and uh, militant progressive causes. Chapter 1. General Principles of Guerrilla Warfare. Essence of Guerrilla Warfare. The armed victory of the Cuban people over the Batista dictatorship was not only the triumph of heroism, as reported by newspapers of the old world, but also forced a change in the old dogmas concerning the conduct of popular masses in Latin America. It showed plainly the capacity of the people to free themselves by means of guerrilla warfare from a government that oppresses them. We consider that the Cuban Revolution contributed three fundamental lessons to the conduct of revolutionary movements in America. These are, number one, that popular forces can win a war against an army. Number two, it is not necessary to wait until all conditions for making a revolution exist. The insurrection can create them. Number three, in underdeveloped America, the countryside is the basic area for armed fighting. Of these three propositions, the first two contradict the defeatist attitude of revolutionaries or pseudo-revolutionaries who remain inactive and take refuge in the pretext that against a professional army, nothing can be done, who sit down to wait until in some mechanical way all necessary objective and subjective conditions are given without working to accelerate them. As these problems were formerly subject of discussion in Cuba, until facts settled the question, they're probably still much discussed in America. He wrote this in fucking 1963, I think was when the, the first, uh, 67, no, originally published, New York Monthly Review Press, 1961, <laughs> and, uh, 19, no, 59 years later, still right there. Naturally, it is not to be thought that all conditions for revolution are going to be created through the impulse given to them by guerrilla activity. It must always be kept in mind that there is a necessary minimum without which the establishment and <laughs> consolidation of the first center is not practicable. People must see clearly the futility of maintaining the fight for social goals within the framework of civil debate. And I have this highlighted. This, this is pretty important. Uh, oh my god, I'm reading it in a book, not this. People must see clearly the utility of maintaining the fight for social goals within the framework of civil debate. This is particularly, uh, uh, resonating with me right now. In the United States so often when uh, folks feel disenfranchised, feel that voting or participating in politics is futile, and I think the vast majority of us do feel this way, what we're, what we're called to, what we're pulled to more often than not is just political inactivity. Uh, trying to remove ourselves, insulate ourselves, protect ourselves, and is kind of weather the storm. But <laughs> it seems to me in some part that uh, 
that privileged, naive notion that you can just hunker down and survive might not be surviving super well. When the forces of oppression come to maintain themselves in power against established law, peace is already broken. Let's read that again. When the forces of oppression come to maintain themselves in power against established law, peace is considered already broken. What, what he's saying, and it's transparent, that guerrilla warfare, that, that organizing a guerrilla militant cause, is not going to succeed if people, one, believe there is any way within the mechanisms of the system to accomplish their goals, and two, <laughs> it necessitates that the forces in power break their own rules in order to maintain that power, to demonstrate to the folks being subjugated and oppressed that the power structure is a sham, that the social contract has been broken and has been broken for a long time. In these conditions, popular discontent expresses itself in more active forms. An attitude of resistance finally crystallizes in an outbreak of fighting provoked initially by the conduct of the authorities. So even, even in that statement, in these conditions popular discontent expresses itself in more active forms, provoked initially by the conduct of the authorities. Uh, Che's voice here is not advocating that people strike a first blow or something like that. It's It's sentimentality and its attitude is that the first blow is struck by the authorities, by the oppressive force, by the empowered force, and that guerrilla warfare, militantism, is a reactive, is a response, is a defensive call, not an offensive one. It's a protective call. Where a government has come into power not through some form of popular vote, fraudulent or not, and maintains at least an appearance of constitutional legality, the guerrilla outbreak cannot be promoted, since the possibilities of peaceful struggle have not yet been exhausted. We still have the auspice of a popular vote, though it's increasingly blatantly fraudulent, not representative at all. In fact, we don't really have a popular vote. We, <laughs> we haven't ever had a popular vote. We've had things that look like popular votes, but candidates who receive the most votes do not win. It's candidates who receive the most delegates, or candidates who receive the most Uh, votes in the Electoral College, not the candidate who actually has popular support. So it's it's kind of an edge case there if we qualify for that or not. I think, and I, I feel this is an increasingly popular notion that Americans are becoming aware of just how fraudulent and corrupt our electoral system is. I mean, if fucking Donald Trump can become president and Joe Biden is the presumptive Democratic nominee. Come the fuck on. And Hillary Clinton before that? Yeah, sure, let's just get these filthy rich centrists who are wildly self-interested and have no interest in helping the common people. Let's elect them? Really? That's what people want? No, that's just what the mechanisms of power are there to perpetuate. The third proposition is a fundamental of strategy. It ought to be noted that those who maintain dogmatically that the struggle of the masses is centered on city movements, entirely forgetting the immense participation of the country people in the life of all underdeveloped parts of America. Of course, the struggles of the city masses of organized workers should not be underrated. 
but the real possibilities of engaging in armed struggle must be carefully analyzed where the guarantees which customarily adorn our constitutions are suspended or ignored. In these conditions, the illegal workers' movements face enormous dangers. They must function secretly without arms. The situation in the open country is not so difficult. There, in places beyond the reach of repressive forces, inhabitants can be supported by armed guerrillas. So although the majority of people live in cities, and historically in the 60s and today, uh, metropolitan areas are classically seen as being more liberal, being more progressive, being hotbeds of socialist anarchist activity, which she is saying here, if you're trying to build a movement, if you're trying to build an active resistance, you need to be off the radar. And you cannot do that very easily in an urban environment. You can try and have limited successes, but it's much, much easier if you're out in the country. Though, I think in the modern era of spy satellites and <laughs> GPSs in our cell phones, you have to try a lot harder to enjoy the anonymity that they did. We will later make a careful analysis of these three conclusions that stand out in the Cuban revolutionary experience. We emphasize them now at the beginning of this work as our fundamental contribution. Guerrilla warfare, the basis of the struggle of people to redeem itself, have diverse characteristics, different facets. Even though the essential will for liberation remains the same, it's obvious, and writers on the theme have said it many times, that war responds to a certain series of scientific laws. Whoever ignores them will go down to defeat. Guerrilla warfare, as a phase of war, must be ruled by all of these. But besides, because of its special aspects, a series of corollary laws must also be recognized in order to carry it forward. Geographical, no, though geographical and social conditions in each country determine the mode and specific conditions in each country determine the... Blah, blah, I reread the same line. Though geographical and social conditions in each country determine the mode and particular forms that guerrilla warfare will take, there are general laws that hold for all fighting of this type. Our task, at the moment, is to find the basic principles of this kind of fighting and the rules to be followed by people seeking liberation, to develop theory from facts, to generalize and give structure to our experience for the profit of others. Let us first consider the question, who are the combatants in guerrilla warfare? On one side, we have a group composed of the oppressor and their agents, the professional army, well armed and disciplined in many cases receiving foreign help as well as the help of the bureaucracy and the employ of the oppressor. On the other side are the people of the nation or region involved. It's important to emphasize that the guerrilla warfare is a war of the masses, a war of the people. The guerrilla band is an armed nucleus, the fighting vanguard of the people. It draws its great force from the mass of the people themselves. The guerrilla band is not to be considered inferior to the army against which it fights simply because it's inferior in firepower. Guerrilla warfare is used by the side which is supported by a majority, but which possesses a much smaller number of arms for use in defense against oppression. The guerrilla fighter needs full help from the people of the area. This is an indispensable condition. This can be clearly seen by considering a case of bandit gangs that operate in a region. They all have characteristics of a guerrilla army. Homogeneity, respect for the leader, valor, knowledge of the ground, and often even good understanding of tactics to be employed. The only thing missing is the support of the people. And inevitably, these gangs are captured and exterminated by public force. Analyzing the mode of operation of the guerrilla band, seeing its form of struggle and understanding its base in the masses, we can answer the question, why does the guerrilla fighter fight? We must come to the inevitable conclusion that the guerrilla fighter is a social reformer. That they take up arms, responding to the angry protest of people against their oppressors, and that they fight in order to change the social system that keeps their unarmed brothers and sisters in ignominy and misery. They launch themselves against the conditions of the reigning institutions at a particular moment and dedicate themselves with all the vigor 
that circumstances permit to breaking the mold of those institutions. And obviously Che has a a very valorous idea of what a revolutionary is and was. That's quite striking. When we analyze more fully the tactic of guerrilla warfare, we'll see the guerrilla fighter needs to have a good knowledge of the surrounding countryside, the paths of entry and escape, the possibilities of speed and maneuver, good hiding places. Naturally, also, he must count on the support of the people. All this indicates that the guerrilla fighter will carry out his action in wild places of small population, since in these places the struggle of the people for reforms is aimed primarily and almost exclusively at changing the social form of land ownership. The guerrilla fighter is above all an agrarian revolutionary. They interpret the desires of the great peasant mass to be owners of the land owners of the means of production, of their animals, of all that which they've long yearned to call their own, of that which constitutes their life, and will also serve as their cemetery. It should be noted that in current interpretations there are two different types of guerrilla warfare, one of which, the struggle complementing great regular armies such as caused with Ukrainian fighters in the Soviet Union, does not enter into this analysis. We are interested in the other type, the case of an armed group engaged in a struggle against a constituted power, whether colonial or not, which establishes itself as the only base which builds itself up in rural areas. In all such cases, whatever ideological aims that may inspire the fight, the economic aim is determined by the aspiration towards ownership of land. Now this, uh... Maybe not the case in the United States. May, maybe not one-to-one -one applicable. In Cuba at this time, land ownership was a huge fucking deal. And it's still a big deal in the United States. But land ownership is a, a bit more nebulous. We don't have the same sort of um, immobile, impoverished farm workers that... Cuba did, not by percentage of population. We have immigrant and migrant farm workers. We have folks who fit the bill, kind of, but we're very mechanized here. We're very automated here. We are uh, even moving away from folks leading that agrarian lifestyle on their own, family farms or small businesses or even big businesses. It's mostly of large, large corporations with factory farms and with massive farming operations, or like Monsanto that sell the seeds that farmers use and by proxy control that as well. So I don't know if it's exactly a one-to-one, -one, but this is, this is 59 years ago, right? It's It's been a minute. The China of Mao begins as an outbreak of worker groups in the South, which it defeated and almost annihilated. It succeeds in establishing itself and begins its advance only when, after the long march from Yenin, it takes up its base in rural territories and makes agrarian reform its fundamental goal. The struggles of Ho Chi Minh is based in rice-growing peasants, oppressed by French colonial yoke, with this force, it went forward to defeat the colonialists. In both cases, there's a framework of patriotic war against the Japanese invader, but the economic basis of a fight for the land has not disappeared. In the case of Algeria, the I grand idea of Arab nationalism has its economic counterpart in the fact that nearly all the Arab land of Algeria was utilized by a million French settlers. In other countries, such as Puerto Rico, where special conditions of the island have not permitted a guerrilla outbreak, the nationalist spirit, deeply wounded by discrimination that is daily practiced, has had at its basis the aspiration of the peasants, even though many of them are already a proletariat, to recover the land that the Yankee invaders seized from them. 
This same central idea, though in different forms, inspired small farmers, peasants, and slaves of the eastern estates of Cuba to close ranks and defend together the right to possess land during the Thirty-Year War of Liberation. Taking account the possibility of the development of guerrilla warfare, which is transformed with the increase in the operating potential of guerrilla band into a war positions, this type of warfare, despite its special character, is to be considered as an embryo, a prelude of the other. The possibilities of the growth of the guerrilla band and of its changes in the mode of fight until conventional warfare is reached are as great as the possibilities of defeating the enemy in each of the different battles combats or skirmishes that take place. Therefore, the fundamental principle is that no battle, no combat, no skirmish is meant to be fought unless it is meant to be won. There is a malevolent definition that says a guerrilla fighter is a Jesuit of warfare. By this is indicated a quality of secretiveness, treachery, of surprise that is obviously an especial, essential element of guerrilla warfare. It's a special kind of Jesuitism, naturally prompted by circumstances, which necessitates acting at certain moments in ways different from romantic and sporting conceptions with which we are taught to believe that war is fought. War is always a struggle in which one contender tries to annihilate the other. Besides using force, they have to will have recourse to use all possible tricks and stratagems in order to achieve that goal. Military strategy and tactics are a representation by analysis of the objectives of the groups and the means of achieving these objectives. These means contemplate taking advantage of all the weak points of the enemy. The fighting action of each individual platoon in a large army in a war of positions will present the same characteristics as those of the guerrilla band. It uses its secretiveness, treachery, and surprise, and when these are not present, it's because of vigilance on the other side prevents surprise. But since Guerrilla Band is a division unto itself, and since there are large zones of territory not controlled by the enemy, it is always possible to carry out guerrilla attacks in such a way as to assure surprise. It is the duty of the guerrilla fighter to do so. It's, it's really interesting that in Shay's mind, there's no, there's no line between this is a rogue agent or just a small cell you know often often when we we hear in popular media we talk about today um terrorist groups or paramilitary groups we talk about things that lack our classical military structure is not being real armies but so far as Che is concerned they are real armies anytime you are engaged in armed conflict you are a real army and you should operate by strategy and tactics just like anyone else and you may employ different tactics but that's just because it's demanded by the terrain, by geography, by tactical, strategic conditions. And that the attitude should be, in the long run, that the audio just cut out. I found that deeply disconcerting. I'll be back. In the long run, there's no difference. That a fight is a fight is a fight. A war is a war is a war, regardless of the scale. Hit and run. Some will call this scornfully. And it's accurate. Hit and run. Wait. Lie in ambush. Hit again. And run. And repeatedly without giving any rest to the enemy. There is, in all of this, it would appear a negative quality. An attitude of retreat. Of avoiding frontal fights. However, this is consequent upon the general strategy of guerrilla warfare which is in the same and its ultimate end is any warfare to win to annihilate the enemy so uh, you know 
uh, especially in the early 21st century, even even in the 90s, uh, in the 80s, the United States, in its wars in the Middle East and the Balkans and Africa, got the rest of the world, has characterized those utilizing. <laughs> Uh, guile and tactics and strategy as cowardly as in some way not not living up to this uh, chivalrous idea that you know everyone gets on their horses and lines up in a straight line and you just ram them together and then you know whoever wins wins but that's never been a reality of warfare <laughs> really. not not at all it's always been messy and full of intrigue and deception and terror and horror it's not supposed to be a pretty thing I I want to I want to reflect one line here uh, when he says without giving any rest to the enemy that is like a one-to-one -one. from Sun Tzu's Art of War. <laughs> um, yeah. If he is taking ease, give him no rest. If his forces are... Yeah. Um, oh, come on. Just, just give me the quote. Ease. If your enemy is secure at all points, be prepared for him. If he's in superior strength, evade him. If your opponent is temperamental, seek to irritate him. Pretend to be weak, but he may grow arrogant. If he is taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. If sovereign and subject are in accord, put division between them. Attack where he is unprepared, and appear where you are unexpected. Sun Tzu, Art of War. This is thousands of years old, <laughs> but uh, with with that kind of continuity, you get an indication that Shay knows what he's talking about here. <laughs> Very well, obviously. Thus, it is clear that guerrilla warfare is a phase that does not afford itself opportunities to arrive at complete victory. So, guerrilla warfare is not the totality of the war, it is a phase of the war, the opening days of the war. And... You know, you're not going to just win a total victory by doing this, but that's not the point. The point is to build up to it. It's one of the initial phases of warfare, and will develop continuously until the guerrilla army, in its steady growth, acquires characteristics of a regular army. At that moment, it will be ready to deal final blows to the enemy and to achieve victory. Triumph will always be a product of a regular army, even though its origins or in a guerrilla army. Just as a general of a division in a modern war does not have to die in front of his soldiers, the guerrilla fighter, who is a general of himself, need not die in every battle. <laughs> They're ready to give their life, but the possibility, the, the positive quality of the guerrilla fighter is precisely that each one of the guerrilla fighters is ready to die. Not to defend an ideal, but rather to convert the ideal into reality. This is the basis, the essence of guerrilla fighting. Miraculously, a small band of people, the armed vanguard of a great popular force that supports them, goes beyond the immediate tactical objective. It was on decisively to achieve an ideal, to establish a new society, to break old modes as outdated, and to achieve, finally, social justice for which they fight. Considered thus, all of these disparaged qualities acquire a true nobility, the nobility of the end at which they aim. It becomes clear that we're not speaking of distorted means of reaching an end. This fighting attitude. This attitude of not being dismayed at any time, this inflexibility when confronting the great problems of the final objective, 
is also the nobility of the guerrilla fighter. Now, I, I only read you the first, first section, first 14 pages. This goes on for, oh, 140. <laughs> and then some because it includes his 1963 on guerrilla warfare. I, I think I'm going to cut it there. It's been half an hour. I, I've been hearing a lot of, uh, I think the term folks are using are doomers, talking about, well, it looks like Bernie isn't going to win the Democratic nomination, that uh, there's been voter suppression here and here and here and here, that the young vote and minority votes have been... Uh, <laughs> pretty blatantly fucked with that if you look at exit polling versus actual results from the votes that they're off by huge huge margins that almost certainly indicate that something fucky is going on there even if you look at where we know where things have gone wrong like in Iowa where votes that had gone to Bernie through the system somehow get assigned to other candidates and so on and so forth and I totally appreciate if you haven't been following this if you are more moderately minded it sounds very conspiratorial it sounds very like, like we're crazy here we're making this shit up and this is America this wouldn't happen here land of the free democracy da 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 no no buddy we're we're pretty fucked up here. And the younger progressive generation is becoming painfully aware of that. It is my great concern that if a candidate like Sanders is not made the nominee, then well, the Democrats are going to lose in November. The, the only choice they have is if they would like to have a progressive president, i.e. Sanders, who would get the popular vote because it would mobilize the Democratic base, or if they want a pseudo-fascist, Trump, to stay president. No way in hell Biden's going to win. No shot. If Clinton can't do it, my man Joe ain't gonna do it. With um, an epidemic, pandemic on our hands, even if it only kills two percent of the population, that's that's millions of people, millions of people. Our our economy will fucking collapse and is collapsing in front of our eyes. Uh, the federal government and the Fed are just pumping money into the stocks, into the stock market, into companies trying to keep them afloat not working unemployment's spiking like crazy uh, particularly in major metropolitan areas particularly in Seattle the end result of boom bust cycles like this with the market is that right now about god 80 90 percent of the market stock market is owned by I think the 10% wealthiest people in the United States and every time this kind of boom bust cycle happens the people hurt the most are the poorest people when the market finally bottoms out the people who have the capital at that point are either people who are getting loans from the government because apparently what we're doing is giving loans to them instead of you know workers of course, uh, what does does capitalism not make sense if you put it under any scrutiny? Um, that eighty percent becomes ninety percent. That ninety percent becomes ninety five percent, etc., etc., etc. The the amount that the wealthiest can invest when they bottom out is magnitudes magnitudes greater than everyone else and so they consolidate power and they consolidate capital and they consolidate wealth and influence 
And this has happened over and over and over and over and over. It's almost engineered to happen at this point. And the slice, the slice of the pie that is being afforded to the proletariat, to the working class in the United States, and the middle class doesn't fucking exist. You're either an owner or a worker. If you are under the mistaken impression that you are middle class, you're wrong, buddy. I'm sorry. You might make more than I do, but probably not much, because, dog, I'm in the top 50%. I don't make shit. <laughs> it's getting to the point where economic disparity is making folks' lives unlivable to the point that the rather conservative government we have is considering universal basic income. And if it's gotten that bad, that UBI is seen as the only way to stabilize things, and I'm not against UBI, but I do th feel like it speaks very poorly for a system that you have to admit, okay, so this system can't even support people for their base needs anymore. And in order to keep our labor force working so that people who are investing can make money, we need to make it so they have enough to eat and go to work. I, I fucking hate that that's the motivation. I hate that that's the motivation. Uh, God, I looked up this quote earlier. Nine days of food away from anarchy at uh, nine meals nine meals from anarchy who dish uh ah alfred henry lewis in 1906 said that there are only nine meals between mankind and anarchy and, well, nine meals is three days, give or take. If you are only eating once a day, that's nine days. Let's say it's a week. A week and a half at the most. Supermarkets now are running out of food, and there's this reassurance that, oh, they'll be restocked. I mean, now they will, but, what, well, we're... Not even a month into this. We're like three weeks into this. That this isn't sustainable. <laughs> we we don't have the kind of food production to keep up with this, especially if our labor force is sick. Especially given how much food we import from China and how much of their labor force is sick and self-isolating and how much they're having to feed their own population. This isn't even speaking about our inability to test people because we can't do that and even if we do even if the tests are free the other administrative costs associated with the tests and other tests that you have to get in order to qualify for the test like flu one flu two etc etc those still aren't free so you're still spending hundreds the hundreds of dollars even if you're insured getting tested if you're uninsured worse and that's assuming you could even qualify for testing to qualify for testing the cdc still requires that stupid stupid conditions where you're already needing ICU treatment at that point so the testing's kind of a moot point if you qualify for it what you need at that point is actually treatment so they're only testing to verify that you have this thing that they don't have an easier way to treat things are bad things are horrible right now but they're bad they're, they're pretty fucking bad, and if our uh, cities keep shutting down, and they should, objectively, to cover this crisis, cities should shut down payments on rent, mortgage, uh, eviction should be deferred, the utilities should be free, fucking internet should be free, it should all be nationalized, <laughs> and just kept online and maintained for the well-being of society without thought to profit, but... 
in America, that's not going to happen. And so a lot of people, a lot of people who a year ago were advocating for stricter gun laws, were advocating for the importance of organizing to, to vote, to participate in civic society the way that structurally it's designed to, I'm increasingly hearing people talking about stocking up on staples, buying weapons to protect themselves with, and this, this uh, doomer sensation that this will get apocalyptic, this will get violent. I can't say that they're wrong. I, I can't say that they're right. I'm I'm pessimistic. I'm not that pessimistic. We'll see what happens. But if you are in that mentality, if you are thinking everything's gonna give a shit, well, it may. It may. You might not be wrong. And if you're right, really a productive thing you can do with your time is go read this. Go read this. Go read Che Guevara's guerrilla warfare there are free versions of it online then one this one's apparently hosted at ncsu uh this is i mean you can buy copies of it i have a physical copy of it but go go read this shit online if you think it's gonna get this bad well educate yourself read about when it has gotten this bad what people have done what's what's worked what has proved effective in organizing in revolutionary times it's scary i know and it's gonna be but you can prepare because we've been through worse this isn't a bubonic plate So it feels like it, maybe. It won't be the worst our species has been through. But it's a pivotal moment, an important moment. If you are feeling unsure and afraid, I, I would not advocate getting a weapon. Join join the DSA. Join your local chapter or form a local chapter. If you're not socialists, we'll find an anarchist group to belong to. or uh, the Communist Party of America, I think, still exists. Uh, honestly, I went with the DSA, and I've mentioned this before, because they are experiencing the most rapid growth of any socialist or leftist or progressive organization in American history. Bar none. That's pretty exciting. The Sanders campaign, from the beginning. Not me, us. The point, ostensibly, is to get him in office. It'd be nice. But he has said even if he got into office, that the movement does not stop there. The fight and the movement go on. We collaborate, we organize, we unionize, we work together, we help each other. And we do the small things we can today. We stick up for people that we can. And we get through to tomorrow. And we hope that the momentum keeps growing, and people keep joining, people keep getting educated and radicalized, and have the <laughs> absolute gall to believe that they deserve to live in a world where people deserve a home, and food, and health care. And fair representation to live in a world without bigotry, sexism, racism, ageism, ableism, that humanity can do better, must do better, and if we're going to su survive, has to do better. Yeah. I, I feel like the Democratic nomination is probably just going to continue to be heartbreaking. And devastating and frustrating. Be mad, we theory, but at the end of the day, and I swear to God, I'll stop here. Don't tune out. 
don't give up. Because unfortunately there's no one here but us. And if we're not going to change things, we're not going to ceaselessly, restlessly advocate. No one's going to for us. And younger generations might not get a chance. I know, I know, it's not the most optimistic place to let out, but, but really... Dog, it was a stretch even getting that positive. Until... Well, tomorrow or whenever else I can be you been you. I'd love to read more of this with you. I'm not gonna do it though. It'd be a long, long time. Till whenever, toodaloo, take care. Bye bye. Or, you know, we can just keep recording. That's cool too. Hotkeys, why you do this to me? No? Oh, alright, alright. Bye.